I do see we have we have a few folks on the line. We are just getting in. I see that uh, Chris has popped on here. Sheila, William, and we've got other people popping in too. So this is quite frankly something I'm really excited to to do for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, we haven't really done a lot of this before. This is actually a simultaneous recording for both a simultaneous live event and a recording for our podcast. At least part of it will be recorded for the podcast at the same time. So uh, we've got we've got a lot of different things going on here, but. Uh, the other reason I'm ridiculously excited is because we have with uh, with me today as our guest instructor, uh, Emily Wapnick. Emily has been, by the way, she's been on the show. She has uh, done a spot for us for Career Change Bootcamp in the past. Uh, Emily is is the author of How to Be Everything, new book that is coming out here pretty darn quick uh, if it hasn't hit shelves already. And also at the same time, she is coiner of phrases, um, spreader of uh, words like multi-potentialite, and just in general, really cool peeps. So really excited to have, uh, have you here, Emily, with us on uh, both the show and the <laughs> webinar and I don't know, the 15 other things that we have going on here at the same time. Really appreciate you making the time. Oh, thanks for having me. This is great. It's so much fun. <laughs> it, uh, it's been a lot of fun in the past. And this is actually, geez, this is like the third or fourth time that we've gotten to do something like this now. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of overlap in our communities. There's, uh, you know, a lot of multi-potentialites. Yeah. In both, I think. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, that's what we've discovered. And I think the, <laughs> I know I've told you this, but for everybody else's benefit too, uh, part of the way that, uh, that you and I met is I had um, probably five or six or seven, I can't even remember, right initially, like all at once within a, within a few days or a week or so of our clients and our students reach out to me at the same time. And they kept sending me the same <laughs> link over and over again. And it was this person named Emily who had done a TEDx talk uh, about, you know, what if you don't have just one true calling? And then, uh, and then you and I ended up uh, meeting via Twitter and uh, much, much later over tea in, in Portland area. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think that was like two years ago almost, as crazy as yeah, that sounds. Yeah, sounds, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember you being like, thanks a lot, Emily. I'm, my, my inbox is getting flooded <laughs> thanks to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's how it all happened. A little bit of behind the scenes for you. But um, one of the reasons I've enjoyed and we've ha having you and, and we've had you back on a couple of different times is because it's very, very relevant what you have expertise and quite frankly, a lot of self-experience in too, in addition to just working with people. Now, um, you really specialize with people that have that have lots of different interests. That's probably the most simplistic way to say it. But how do you, how do you describe that? And then you know, we're going to jump into it full on here. And then you're going to lead us through some of the things that you and I, I have talked about would be really incredibly beneficial for our audience in the past. But um, how do you describe that? And then give us a little bit of a tidbit about what we're going to get to learn. Yeah, totally. Um, so I help multi-potentialites build lives around their many passions. And so a multi-potentialite is someone with many interests and creative pursuits. And maybe that means that you dive into one thing for a while and then you kind of lose interest and you become fascinated by something else and you dive into that and you sort of move through your interests one after the next after the next. Or maybe you've got like five different things going on at the same time. There's no one way to be a multi-potentialite. Really, it just means that you're very curious about a lot of unrelated subjects. Which, uh, which I love. And... <laughs> Today, I know one of the things that we're going to spend some time talking about is how how people can look at kind of the intersection between all of these different interests and uh, passions and what, whatever you want to call the things that fall into that group um, and how how you can earn money mm -hmm. from that. Because for many people, not everybody, but most of us, there's that, that necessity, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That has been, I mean, that was kind of like the um, impetus for me to write this book. I just, I had been blogging about this stuff for a while and kind of learning from other people who 
do many different things, sharing what I'm learning, you know, got this community, but I really wanted to figure out how multi-potentialites make a living. Like, where does the money come from? How do they structure their work? And so that I embarked on this big research project, which turned into this book. And I am, I'm glad you did. I remember talking to you when we were sitting in the, uh, sitting having tea, I remember talking to you about that, this book in particular, like you were still choosing the title mm -hmm. and everything else and going through all the stuff that you do when you're writing a book and you're like in the midst of it and you're like, oh, it is, it is so hard, but I, I'm glad you did. I'm glad that, uh, that you pushed through because I think it's uh, well worth it on the receiving end because I've had a chance to take a, uh, take a gander at it, go through it and it's good stuff. By Thanks. the way, yeah, Thanks. yeah. So, hey, let's jump into this, okay. and I'm gonna I'm gonna relinquish control here, and you can you can take us on this journey so that we can talk about how how you can have lots of interest and how you can still add value to the world and uh, receive value back, likely in the form of money, uh, and how all this stuff can connect together. Sounds good. Cool. All right, so. When people ask me what my book is about, I always say that it's a career guide for people who have many passions and don't just want to do one thing. So if that sounds like you, then you are in the right place. Uh, I start the book off with slide. There we go. Okay. I start the book off uh, with a story that I'm going to tell here because I think it really kind of exemplifies my quote unquote problem and kind of where everything came to a head for me. So 10 years ago, it was my 23rd birthday and I was out at lunch with my roommate and we bumped into an old acquaintance, my former acting teacher from when I was in high school. And you know, I, I bump into her from every couple of years around town. And so we were catching up. She told me about how her acting studio was going. And then she asked me what I was up to. And at this point, I, I was just finishing up undergrad. I had studied communications and film production, and I had randomly taken a law class and had become totally fascinated by this new way of looking at the world and had decided to apply to law school. And I got in. And so I was kind of in this transition period, and I was very excited about it. And I kind of enthusiastically said, I'm starting law, law school in the fall. And her reaction was a, little, was a little weird. She kind of got this grimace on her face and she was like, I thought you were going to be a filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I didn't really know how to respond to that. I think I just kind of shrugged and was like, nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, but it, it made me feel really kind of ashamed and it, it just made me feel like, there it is, my problem. You know, I'm some, I cannot commit to something for the long term. I can't stick with any one thing. Like, I don't know who I am. Just all of these kinds of uh, thoughts rush into my head and it really bugged me, that interaction. And it's something that I thought about for a few years after that happened. Um, so fast forward, I'm a couple years I'm graduating from law school. I know I don't want to be a lawyer because uh, you know that's not really the, the life that I want. And also I'm kind of, the law thing has kind of run its course. I'm interested in something else now. Um, and you know, I'm thinking about this and I'm like, I, I think this was the first time when I decided, I like made the conscious choice to not regard this quality that I have in you know, my pattern of jumping around as a bad thing. And I was like, you know what? this is who I am, this is how my brain works, I'm gonna find a way to make it work. Like I, want, I don't wanna be jumping between jobs all the time and worrying about where the paycheck's gonna come from. I wanna find a way to live a stable life and have a thriving career and still get to explore many different things. So that was where the idea for my blog Putty Like came about. That was in 2010. And I just, I started thinking like, maybe there are other people out there like this and we can kind of come together and figure this stuff out. Maybe there are other people out there who are already doing multiple things that I can learn from. And I can share what I'm learning. Let's just see where this goes. So I started blogging um, and Let's see, I've already talked about what a multi-potentialite is, so I'll jump over that a little bit, but it turns out there are a lot of other people out there like this. And this is the word that I use to describe people like us. There are other terms out there that you may have heard of, generalist, polymath, renaissance person, scanner, 
it's not really about the word, it's more about the idea behind the word, so use whichever word um, resonates for you. Uh, but yeah, so I, I really wanted to understand how multi-potentialites make a living. And a few years after blogging, after I started blogging, I was like, okay, I think I think I might need to write a book about this because there are there's a handful of books about this phenomenon, about multi-potentialites and scanners and stuff, but they don't tend to go very deep into the work side of things, like into actually like making money, right? And then you've got these traditional career guides that really are meant for specialists. So what they'll do is they'll help you kind of, you know, you assess your aptitudes and your skills and your passions and you kind of whittle it down to that one perfect fit. And that approach doesn't work for multi-potentialites. So I felt like there was this gap where there just weren't very many career and work resources for multipots. So my methodology, my methodology goes as follows. I decided that I was going to conduct interviews and do a bunch of surveys because I have this huge audience now of multi-potentialites. So I chose about 50 people to interview um, and they were multi-potentialites who self-described as being both happy and financially comfortable. And then I sent out a few more surveys and got a couple thousand responses beyond that. So I had quite a bit of data to work with a while to go through. Um, and what I really wanted to understand is, is how multi-potentialites structure their careers, how they make a living. And it was kind of frustrating at first because I realized very quickly that multi-potentialites can be found in any and every career. And it was like, where do I start? You know, some people love being an architect because they get to blend the sciences and the arts and use left brain, right brain. And other people that would not work, other people like being an entrepreneur because they get to set their own schedule. Other people like being, uh, you know, a teacher. Like there was just, it was really hard to find some commonalities. But what I did discover was that everyone, everyone that I spoke to had kind of these three things, they all had these three key ingredients in their lives and in their careers. First is that they had sufficient amount of money and that is obviously different from person to person. Some of us are quite frugal, others have more expensive taste. It's really important to kind of get clear on your financial goals. They also had careers that provided them with a sense of meaning. So we don't just want a a career where you're doing a lot of different things, you're making money, but you don't really care about anything that you're doing. You know, you want a sense that you're contributing to the world, like you're making a difference. And then finally, they all had the right amount of variety. And I think this is the one that is, I, I, you know, it might be important for, for specialists as well, but for multi-potentialites, it's really essential. And it's something that's lost in a lot of conventional career models. Like, you know, it's, you're not going to go to a regular guidance counselor, career counselor, and they're, they're not gonna be like, yeah, let's figure out how to start a career in two or more fields. Like, let's figure out how to get variety into, like, it's not really a conversation that is being had. Um, Doctor, but, lawyer, and violinist <laughs> slash uh, clay maker slash uh, <laughs> right. attorney slash uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, it's so funny because um, you know, when you're like going through college, it's like, you got to choose a major, right? But no one's like, oh, you've got a major. Like, why don't you, you know, why don't you broaden that out? Because, you know, you're going to be a one trick pony if you just like, right? So like we get accusations of being jack of all trades, master of none, but specialists don't get told like, don't be a one trick pony. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just not, it's not the conversation. Um, so variety is really important for multi-potentialites. And again, the amount required is different from person to person. So if you don't have enough variety in your life, you're gonna feel bored, you're gonna feel like you're not getting to express the, your, the breadth of who you are, um, like you're not living up to those potentials, you know? And if you have too much variety, you'll feel scattered and overwhelmed and like you're not making enough progress on your various projects. So it's about figuring out what that right amount is for you. I mean, do you do really well with three projects on your plate? Do you like having 10 projects on your plate? Are you someone who likes going through your projects kind of more sequentially, one after the next, and maybe you've got like six month contracts or you kind of change industries every five to 10 years? Like, what does that look like for you? Okay, so, oh, 
Okay, jumped ahead a little bit. Um, so the big question is, how do you get your money, meaning, and variety into your life and into your career? And um, like I said, people had all kinds of different jobs in various industries. What I did was I ended up picking out these four commonly used work models that I kept seeing again and again. So I'm gonna go through those. I know Scott, last time we spoke, I went through them, but I'm gonna go into um, quite a bit more detail. And um, keep in mind that you are welcome to be a hybrid. You can mix and match these. I never like to tell my multi-potential like, audience that they need to choose one thing. You must fit into this category. Yeah, yeah that <laughs> Pick one work. of the four. No. <laughs> um, it's just a starting, a starting point and a way to kind of see what other people are doing. And you can totally customize these and make them your own. Okay. So the first commonly used work model is what I call the group hug approach. And that's because if you could just imagine all of your interests coming together in one big group hug, that's kind of what I'm going for with oh. that metaphor. Um, here's the official definition. It's uh, having a multifaceted job or business that allows you to wear many hats and shift between several domains at work. So I'm actually going to read a little quote from my book because I think that this person expresses it better than I ever could. So Jimena Velos is an urban planner, which is a career in a naturally interdisciplinary field. Over the course of a single week, you might find her researching, mapping, conducting field visits, interviewing people, working with communities, drafting reports, organizing events, planning the implementation of policy, designing, communicating to the public, advocating for a project to be approved, and evaluating completed projects. She has ample opportunity to be both theoretical and practical. Jimena also gets to work in a variety of contexts. Quote, you can stay inside, do research, think nonstop and discuss with colleagues, but then you get to go out and do field work. And the definition of urban is so broad that you can explore a number of different areas, housing, transportation, environment, education, arts, agriculture, economics, architecture, design, landscape, politics, history. That's funny. That's what my mom does, actually. My mom. Oh, yeah? Urban, yeah, urban and regional growth planner. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So a job like that, you wear many different hats, get to do a lot of different things. Really good approach for a multi-potentialite. And there we go, that's actually strategy number one to kind of create this for yourself. I, I feel like you can you can either find an interdisciplinary, like a, a multifaceted job like this, or you can create one and we'll get into a few other strategies, but this is one approach. So you sort of look at your interests and you say, are there any fields that encompass several of these that are kind of at the intersection of several of my interests? And maybe there's an interdisciplinary field out there where you can kind of use your different skills and, and curiosities and bring them into your work. Um, I've got a, my editor asked me if I could make a list and it, it was actually really challenging because there are a lot of interdisciplinary <laughs> fields out there and it kind of depends on how you look at them sometimes. But I did include an appendix at the end that's got several interdisciplinary fields plus their, the elements that kind of go into each one. So what are a couple of quick examples of those? Sure. Just to give people an idea of what you mean when, when you say that. Absolutely. Okay. Bioethics. Uh, elements, life sciences, technology, medicine, politics, law, philosophy. Um, then we've got something like instructional design, which involves education theory, neuroscience, technology, interactive media design, psychology, research, storytelling, communications, programming, film, gamification, visual design, web design, audio production, technical writing, editing. Um, I'll just, yeah, so then there's things like bioinformatics, creative coding, design, education, which is actually quite broad, event management, integrative medicine, sustainable development, um, uh, publishing, <laughs> Uh, my uh, my editor and agent both came to me several times while I was writing this book, being like, "Oh, I'm doing all these different things. I'm, you know, this is a great <laughs> job for a multi potential." Okay, I'll put that in the book. <laughs> but yeah, okay. So the second strategy to kind of find or create a group hug career is to ask where the multi potentialites hang out. 
Sometimes in a particular industry or field, there will be a subset or a school of thought where the, the multipods tend to gravitate towards. So um, being a teacher, for example, is pretty multifaceted. There's like a lot of different things involved. You have to be a facilitator. You have to sometimes um, be a counselor. You have to understand different learning styles and emotional issues. There's like a lot of things that go into running a classroom. But for some people, that doesn't provide enough variety. So I interviewed a woman named Sarah Meister, who's a teacher at a Waldorf school. And on top of all of that, the way that the, the Waldorf philosophy works uh, and the approach works is that she teaches every subject to her class. So she's with the class all day long and she teaches all the different subjects. And that allows her to focus on a lot of different things and to um, draw connections between different classes. So she can draw a connection between something they're learning in math to something they are learning in art. And that's something that isn't usually done in a conventional school because you've got different teachers teaching different subjects. And then also they go up the grades with their students. So they teach grade one, grade two, grade three, you know, they go up till after they graduate in grade eight and then they start over, which means that you're not teaching the same thing year after year. So that's, there's an example of a particular subset within education, particular philosophy, where you, you know, it's just so multifaceted, you get to focus on so many different things and be really creative, and it's never the same. So that's an interesting point, and I love that example, because one of the things that I've found again and again is that often... You know, people come to people come to us in particular where they they know some of the things they're already interested in, right? Mm -hmm. And their problem isn't what am I interested in? It's usually I've got too many of these things, so they're already aware of some yeah. of the things. And um, that example is great because what I found again and again is that after looking more closely, um, part of what the challenge for not everybody but some people is that they can't see how to bring some of these things together in, in that way because they have a certain view of, say, teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm a teacher, I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, I could not be in a classroom all day long teaching the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm in, you know, if I'm in, I don't know, grade school or something like that, then I could not teach that year after year after year after year. Or if I'm in high school, I could not do that mm -hmm. like every hour after hour, hour. There's no way I, I need more variety. And I, what I find is that often there are ways to be able to tweak that like what you're talking about. And, and that's, um, that's an easier way to think about it. Like what are those small things that need to be tweaked, even if I don't know how it's possible yet? Yeah. And sometimes if you ask around and you look around, you'll find like a, like a, a specialty, I guess, yeah. within an area where it's just more interdisciplinary and there's just, you know, more, more multi-potentialized tend to, move in that direction. There was another woman I spoke to who uh, was studying medicinal chemistry and she was finding it really hard to figure out what to specialize in. And then she discovered science communications, which is like explaining scientific concepts to lay people and all different audiences. And she found that this was very, very um, multifaceted specialty because it just, there's so many different mediums that you work in and you're always dealing with different audiences. And so you blend together a lot of different subjects. That's awesome. Okay. So the third thing is, um, and this is, you know, these aren't uh, exclusive. So, you know, this might be a good thing to think about no matter what is to work for an open-minded organization. So um, smaller organizations, startups tend, not always, but they tend to be a little more open to people stepping out of their job description, kind of taking on more responsibility and initiating new projects. Um, you want to, if you're looking for, if you're looking for an organization to work for, pay attention to the language of the ad. So um, I, in the book, I talk about Threadless, the online t-shirt shop. I once randomly discovered a job listing they had for the position of creative director. And it was like, we're looking for someone who's comfortable working with a cross-disciplinary team, of creative people, blah, 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 stepping out of your comfort zone, trying new things, uh, we want to hear your ideas for the future of the company. And I was like, this ad is calling out for a multi-potentialite right now. So, um, yeah, I think they use the word adaptable, like look out for language like that. 
And I think that at smaller companies, it really is a matter of, you know, they can't afford to hire people to fill every single little role. So they rely more on generalists to kind of do that and to move around. We, I mean, we do the same thing in our company. Mm-hmm. Like we're hiring for two positions right this very second. And I think that's one of the things I'm looking for because we don't have that many people in our company and we need people to be able to wear lots of hats. Yeah. We have, we have to hire multi-potentialites as it turns out. Yeah, same here, same here. I almost always hire multi-potentialites um, except if there's like a one-off thing where I'm like, oh, I need, like, I have this technical problem and I need a programmer to fix this one thing. But for like the day-to-day stuff, yeah, it would be hard if... Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so sometimes you already have a job and you want to um, integrate your other skills into the mix. Uh, this doesn't work for every employer, but um, some of them can be convinced, and it's really about the way that you approach them. Uh, so the key here is to lead with their interests in mind. So um, I spoke with a woman named Margot Yu, who has been at the same company for about 16, 17 years now, but she's jumped around from department to department. And I asked her how she did that kind of thing. And she was telling me about how in the 90s, Um, the internet was just starting to become a thing and she was like she she had initially gotten hired to put together PowerPoint presentations or something but she was like guys this internet thing is gonna be a big deal you really need a website let me build you a website here's why it's gonna be important it's gonna be really important for the business and you know customers finding you all this stuff and they were like okay you know sure give it a go and obviously that that took off and now they've got a whole department and They've got that under control. But what she didn't do is she didn't say, um, I'm, I'm really good at HTML and I really like doing graphic design. And you know, she, she said like, you are gonna need this thing for this reason. So I think that that's, that's really important when you're kind of pitching a project or an initiative is to frame it in terms of their interests. And then if, you know, if you've got to integrate your other skills to make it happen, then so be it. <laughs> Which is fantastic. You can mold your own job that way. I've, right. Yeah. Done that hundreds of times. <laughs> yeah. I worked at a legal clinic one summer and um, we, a big part of what we did was educate the public about copyright and users rights and all this stuff. And I was like, um, I ended up making an animation to explain it um, through this method. I was like, I kind of think it'd be fun to use my, uh, my flash skills. I mean, no one does flash <laughs> anymore, but um So let me like pitch this idea, but I I didn't pitch it being like, oh, I can do this thing. Like I was just like, I think an animation would help communicate the ideas and blah, blah, blah. So that was a lot of fun to to get to do that instead of writing legal memos. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. So strategy number five, and this is a big one, is you can start a business because when you run a business, especially at the beginning, you're going to wear many different hats. You know, there's just so much that goes into it product development, customer service, legal, finance, there's a ton, right? And especially when you're starting out and you can't hire other people, whether they're multi-potentialites or not, to kind of help out with the various things. But what I have found is that a lot of people get stuck on the idea that when they start a business, they need to choose a niche. And that can be really hard for multi-potentialites. So I talk about the idea of the Renaissance business, which is a little bit of a broader business where you Um, maybe offer things in different, you know, products and services in different areas, helping with different things. And there's a way to do this that, so that you're not kind of confusing everyone and uh, you don't, your business doesn't look totally, your brand doesn't look totally scattered. Uh, I'm not going to get into this a ton right now because it's a huge topic, but I've got 472 hours. Yeah. I've got, I've got several blog posts about it though. And I can, send those to you, Scott. You can- Cool. Yeah. That'd be great. Out. Send them over. We'll link them up. Yeah. Yeah. But but I'll just give you a couple examples. So there is um, a cafe in Alabama I discovered while I was doing my research called PyLab. It was actually created by a bunch of designers and it's got all these kind of social justice initiatives and they've got things like um, bike repairs that happen there and um, catering apprenticeships and a lot of discussions. So it's not just a bakery. It's really got this broader social mission. Seems like a really cool place. I'd like to visit sometime. (laughs) Um, Another example, kind of very different type of business. My friend Abe Cahuto is, um, he's a freelancer and he does 
video directing and web design and um, Kickstarter consulting and online course creation, all kind of under this umbrella of helping clients with high impact multimedia storytelling, like helping people tell their stories through various different mediums. Um, so there's another example of someone who does a lot of different things all under the umbrella of one business. Okay, so the second commonly used work model is the slash approach. This is someone who is a programmer slash teacher slash um, uh, doctor slash uh, stand-up comedian you know it's um, with the slash approach you aren't combining your interests in one business or job you're keeping them separate and distinct so the slash approach is having two or more part-time jobs and or businesses that you flip between on a regular basis there's a little diagram I that I the diagram. drew up. Thank you. That looks like <laughs> something I draw. <laughs> I, I'm not the best illustrator, but um, I, I told my editor, I was like, I'm going to try drawing some stuff. I think it'll give it a nice handmade element. Uh, and I think it pretty much works. You know, I'm not awesome. the best illustrator, but I'm kind of proud of these. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so for an example, this is Morgan Seam. And Morgan works part-time at a nonprofit that does prison outreach. She is also a freelance, she does freelance marketing two days a week, and she's an aerial silks artist, which uh, if, you, if you aren't familiar with aerial silks, it, you're kind of like flipping and hanging and flying around in these like giant silk fabrics is pretty impressive. So she gets hired to do aerial silks performances. And she kind of just moves through these three very distinct and very different revenue streams over the course of her week. So for slash careerists, part-time is the dream, meaning that almost everyone I spoke to said that if they, they love each of their different jobs for different reasons, but they wouldn't want to do any one of them full-time. So it's just about that, that right amount. Uh, and it's important to distinguish here about uh, between people who have a bunch of different jobs just to kind of make ends meet, which is fine. You know, everyone has to do that from, or a lot of people have to do that from time to time. But what we're talking about here is really an intentional choice to build a career this way, to say, instead of having one job that I'm going to do all the time, I'm going to have three or four and just kind of move between them. It's intention versus need. Yeah. A slash career is great for people who desire high amounts of freedom and flexibility. Usually slash careers tend to be both employed and self-employed. It's kind of a mix in there. And um, usually there are some jobs or projects that are easier to move around. A lot of people who have artistic pursuits will use the slash approach because if they need to make it to a last minute audition or a gig, they can kind of shift things around and, and make that happen. Um, it's important to be self-directed if you're going to use the slash approach to work because uh, unlike with if you've got like a group hug job or any kind of traditional employment where the rules are really clear, you got to be in the office, you know, it's in this kind of work model, you're really figuring things out for yourself and you've got to be kind of organized. So it's a good approach for people who are very independent and, um, and good at that kind of organizational stuff. So an interesting thing I discovered is that, so a lot of the times multi-potentialites will become fascinated by something that's really, really specific. And we'll kind of be like, oh, I wanna explore this thing. I wanna start working in this area, but I know I'm gonna get bored. It's too narrow. So sometimes all you need is a few different narrow things and then you're good, you know, then you've got the variety still. You're not just doing one really narrow thing. So there was a guy I spoke to named uh, Theodore Jordan who had several really specific offerings. He was entirely self-employed. He designs, um, he does audio, like he may, he, he, that sounds really boring, but well, what he does is he makes weird samples for like, paranormal and like soundtracks for paranormal and ghost hunting shows 
he told me that he had uh, frozen a microphone and had people skate over it and recorded those noises. So like, he does all these like weird things with sounds, really, really specific. Um, and then he also builds websites for insurance companies, like also really narrow, <laughs> very, very niche. Um, he has an online shopping cart blog because he's kind of an online shopping cart nerd and so he's got some affiliate links in there and that's another really specific thing. He was developing a meditation program, like an audio program, another really specific thing. So it, it was interesting to discover this. I, I feel like the narrower our specific interests are, the more of them we need to have in our lives to get that variety, which which makes sense. Whereas if we're into something really interdisciplinary like urban planning, we might not need a bunch of other work projects. So if you've got a lot of niche interests, the slash approach might be a good one. Okay, and then some people will run multiple businesses. So we talked about how you can combine your interests in one business, Another way to deal with the fact that you've got a lot of different interests and you don't just want to do one thing is to have multiple businesses. Some people will do this. Um, often people will build, will start one business at a time and kind of get it going before they jump to the next because starting a business can be, can take quite a lot of effort and time. Um, other people will just be like, I'm going to put myself out there, see what people hire me for and go from there. We see a lot of people that have a um, day job and a side gig as a variation mm -hmm. of this too. Yeah. Um, that's certainly another way to go to where it also spreads out that. Um, and I, I know this is kind of infringing on one of your, one of your other no worries. methods <laughs> a little bit, potentially depending on, depending on the reasons potentially, but um we certainly see that as a, as a variation to where it's intentional on, on keeping those mm -hmm. at the same time or rotating some of those things in and out over years. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, uh, I think a lot of the times that is a good escape plan to kind of have that side hustle and then, but you're right. Some people just like having the two things going and they both bring in income. They're both revenue streams. They just, one might be a little bit more full time than the other. Yeah. 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 Okay. So now we've got the Einstein approach to work. Um, Albert Einstein, for a period, he worked for the, uh, the patent office. He was basically employed by the government. Um, and this was a job that provided him with the money that he needed. So he didn't have to kind of, yeah, it was a very secure job. He didn't have to worry about where the, you know, where what what passions were going to generate income or anything like that, but he explored his various theories on the side. Barbara Sher calls this a good enough job, and so the idea is you've got a job that pays the bills that you enjoy well enough, and it leaves you with enough time and energy to explore your many things on the side. And some people find this approach to be very freeing because they don't need to worry about monetizing every little thing that they're into. Where on earth is that picture from? <laughs> I think I found it on Creative Commons. I should really get the attribution listed there, but um, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> it is a good one. It's also got like a, a little mosaic in the back of him and different, you know, his various. Yeah, that's um, why I was curious. That's what yeah. it was like, I don't know, some shop in Portland. Or, it looks like it might be from a museum. That's my guess, but... <laughs> Anyway. Oh yeah, it does get a little stay off the stay off the uh, I don't know right. stay off, stay the off Einstein. Einstein's head <laughs> sign at the bottom. Um, so the official definition: the Einstein approach is having one full-time job or business that fully supports you, leaving you with time and energy to pursue your other passions on the side. This is probably the diagram I'm most proud of. But <laughs> It's kind of, you've got <laughs> you your good draw, enough. You probably draw some mean stick figures, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Little joke, uh, mostly a compliment. So my, <laughs> I do the exact same thing. I have my iPad like sitting right over there. I, I When I need to visualize a concept, uh, this is what I do. So mine look very, very, very similar. So <laughs> cool. I like to think they look good. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so Charlie, Charlie Harper, 
Uh, this is him in a production of The Addams Family. Um, he's, I asked him for a photo and he sent me one, but he took a little bit too long and I had already grabbed this. And so I decided to run with it because I kind of really like it. <laughs> um, he is an IT guy. He's just like an IT director with a nine to five job and really the kind of standard work. And then he leaves the office and he goes to musical theater practice or acapella practice on the weekends he builds furniture he recently built a boat so classic einstein approach i don't einsteiner i don't know what to call them but he uses the einstein approach i like einsteiner personally. einsteiner okay <laughs> so for that job your main job that kind of supports you to be considered good enough, it must fulfill three criteria. It needs to be enjoyable, preferably even challenging and fun in an area in which you have genuine interest. So it shouldn't be like, oh, I hate my day job, but then I get all to explore all my passions. You know, you want it to be enjoyable. It needs to have a high enough salary to allow you to meet your financial goals as defined by you. If you're not paying your bills, then it's not really a good enough job. You're not going to feel that freedom to explore your many passions on the side. So that's pretty important. And then it needs to leave you with enough free time and energy to pursue your other interests outside of work. If you feel totally drained at the end of the day, or you're expected to answer emails late into the night, that's not really going to work very well either. One of the things that I wondered going into this was I was interviewing people was where people find the energy to go from a full day's work to their passion projects. And what I discovered is that a lot of people will have personal projects that are very different from their day job. So they kind of like shift between different parts of their brain. So like Charlie, for example, is going from a very kind of you know, left brain, logical, linear way of thinking all day long to this artistic, body centric kind of um, expressive activities. Um, and I, I kept finding that over and over again. And I think that is the key. If you spend all day doing one thing and then you go home and you try to do the same thing, you're going to feel pretty tired. You're going to have a hard time doing that. That's interesting. I can totally identify with that. Yeah. Okay. So when you're figuring out which of your skills and passions to turn into that um, good enough job, or I guess, you know, also a good enough business, right? Because you can have a very lucrative business that will pay well and kind of support you. And then you can go and explore without having to worry about money. It's important to think about which of your skills are people, people pay more for. And, um, and, and not just which of your skills, but which of your interests, because you want to make sure you're doing something that you enjoy. So, you know, it's, it's unlikely to find, for better or worse, it's unlikely to find someone whose good enough job is, say, theater directing, right? Because that doesn't usually pay a ton. So that is, people who are theater directors do it more for the love of it, or maybe they use a different work model. But for your good enough business, you definitely want to pick something, or your good enough job, you want to pick something that is going to, that you're interested in that will pay well, so that you can have that freedom to explore on the side. And it's just, it's kind of unfortunate that certain skills are, are valued more than others, but it's something to keep in mind. Okay, so now we've got the fourth, commonly used work model, the Phoenix approach. And I used to call it the sequential approach. I was going to, I was going to yeah. ask you about this. It's like, yeah. has the name changed? Yeah, I, it has. I when we had a conversation <laughs> back when this was called something else. So. Yeah. I mean, but I feel like the Phoenix is actually the perfect metaphor for someone who uses this work model because they yeah. get to the end of their life and then they kind of explode in a burst, in a burst of flames or <laughs> there's the ashes. <laughs> right. And then they rise from the ashes and start a new career in a new area. So, um, yeah, the sequential approach, like, makes sense. It just wasn't as colorful. So. <laughs> Definitely couldn't use this picture for uh, the sequential approach. Exactly, exactly. And the other work models, uh, you know, are, have such good imagery. I just didn't want to leave this one behind. <laughs> so I see the, how you make your decisions here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, you know, it's it's also, like, people remember things oh, yeah. better if it's Oh, yeah. an image associated with it. So I love anyway, it. yeah. So the Phoenix approach is working in a single industry for several months or years, 
then shifting gears and starting a new career in a new field. So Trevor Clark, um, we first met back in 2010. He was another blogger. He was actually the person who coined the term multi-potentialite. Um, and he gave me per permission to run with it. But he, he was a marketer at the time, and then we kind of lost touch. And I noticed a few years later on Facebook that he was posting all of these articles about um, mushroom farming. And it turns out he had started a mushroom farm, they, like, like real mushrooms, you know. Um, and they grew art artisanal, like, like fancy mushrooms for these little like high-end farm-to-table restaurants. Um, and it was just so different from what he had been doing and he was so into it. I mean, he was, he was like talking about Petri dishes and he sounded like a, like a scientist or he was like super into it. And then a few years later, sure enough, he ended up selling his share of the business and he became an operations manager for a local food exchange. A few years after that, he started working as a technical support analyst. So he's someone who moves through his interests sequentially, one after the next after the next, with several years between each switch, as opposed to someone who's using like the slash approach, where there might be several hours between each, or a, a couple hours between each switch, right? So the Phoenix approach to work is really good for people who like to move through their interests sequentially and maybe like going a little bit deeper into one thing before they finally make that switch. Yeah. Were you going to say something? I'm just thinking, I was trying to figure out, uh, I think for me personally, I've used a combination of the, actually all of them at different points in my life, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, definitely the Einstein piece for a while at one point. Mm -hmm. um, that was almost actually my college career. Now that I think about it, because I had a business I was having a ton of fun with, like kind of on the side. At points in time, it was like 60 hours a week on the side, but it was on the side. And then later on, I kept making bunches of career changes, and it was much more, uh, very much like the Phoenix approach. There was one point I was like top of the company, and then you know almost getting fired because I was so bored of it. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's interesting thinking about it just in my own personal context after hearing you talk about this for like the seventh time or so, <laughs> not, not <laughs> counting the TED talk, the 7,200 TED talks that were sent to me. Uh, but yeah, so that's really interesting. And I, I guess that's a little bit proof positive that it really does not have to be one of these mm -hmm. and could even shift over time, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. And I think that the Phoenix approach in particular mm -hmm. lends itself to blending with the others because it's like, while you're in that field, what are you going to do? Are you going to have kind of like a group hug thing going on? Or like, it's, it's so easy. You know, I feel like I'm kind of a mix between the Phoenix approach and the group hug approach right now, because it's like, I move through different interests with about five years between each one. But right now, I'm doing this multi-potentialite putty like business thing and I'm doing so many different things. So I've got like a group hug project going on as, as my main thing, even though I, but I don't know. I mean, I've been at this for six and a half years and I'm not bored yet. So we'll see. Maybe I'm just a group hugger now. <laughs> <laughs> You've shifted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have. And actually, Trevor, I just sent him the slide to check with him that it was all good. Yeah. And he was like, oh, if you want, you can tell them that I'm starting a new thing where I'm teaching um, mushroom growing techniques in an, in an online course. I'm going to combine my, uh, my tech skills with my farming skills. And I was like, oh, great. We're <laughs> going to do the group hug thing now. <laughs> so... You you have, uh, and that's exactly what I was going to ask about. What, mm -hmm. uh, for people that are just starting thinking about it in this particular way, you know, what, what advice would you give? And it looks like you've got some tips for, for giving. I this. do. I have some tips for a smooth transition, <laughs> but um, what do you mean exactly by that question? Well, really what I mean is we've got, we've got lots of people here that are in transition. Yes. And many of the folks that uh, are in our crew change boot camp are they're right now in transition and then many of the people that listen to our podcast are um, either getting ready to be in transition or are in transition uh, right now so 
I am, I'm curious what people can do to take some of this and immediately start applying it. Yeah. Yeah. So I've found that, um, Phoenixes, when they transition to something new, they'll often start building something up on the side for a while and kind of developing those connections and relationships and looking for opportunities. And that, that transition is, you really want to do it smoothly because it can really upend things if you're just like, I'm quitting one day, you know? So, um, yeah, here, I'll go through my, my tips for a smooth transition. And these are actually good tips for just getting into any industry. So reach out to your existing network and just see if anyone has any connections to the thing that you're becoming interested in where you, that you want to move into. Expand your network, get involved, go to events, see who you can meet. It's often about who you know, unfortunately, as you know. Um, a lot of the people I spoke with, it, it depends the industry, but sometimes volunteering is a really good way to even get job offers in the new area and certainly make connections. Um, are you, Scott, are you familiar with Charlie Hohen, his idea of free work? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've interacted with Charlie a little bit, but I don't know him very well. Yeah, so if you're, if you're kind of doing the freelancer thing and you wanna work for small businesses or solopreneurs, you can do what Charlie Hohen calls free work, and that's where you reach out to them and you say, you are doing this thing, but you could be doing it better, or you're not doing this thing at all that I think would really help your business. I want to do it for you for free. Maybe I've even done and created like a, an example to show you. I've already done the work and you just offer to do free work. And after a while, if you're doing amazing work, you pitch the idea of doing paid work. And this has worked for, for Charlie. He worked for Tim Ferriss, he got in that way, and Remy Sethi, and um, several other people. Um, so that's an interesting approach. He's got a free PDF that you can download called uh, Recession Proof Graduate, I believe. And on the free work, I, I love that. I've personally done that mm -hmm. um, and have helped quite a few other people do that same thing. Um, and it, it's very, 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 very effective. And you can actually even combine a couple of these things together to our most recent podcast. In fact, with, um, with Michael Bigelow, who was also, who also involved in career change bootcamp and, um, and also a coaching client at the same time, you know, he, he was essentially reaching out to his, his existing network plus expanding his network. And he was going and meeting these, we had him going and meeting these different people um, that were in some of the industry or some of the companies and industries that he really wanted to be in. He was having conversations with them and then he was trying to identify, Hey, what are the biggest problems in your business in, in mm -hmm. some ways, but not in an annoying way, but a very useful, casual, organic way. And then he would essentially go and he would do the work that they ha didn't have time to do and come back to them and say, Hey, look, here's, Hey, I put this together. Like, uh, you know, take a look at it. Let me know if it's useful. It's exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things that he would do. First of all, he'd get to know the person that way. Plus at the same time, he would be able to, um, decide if he actually enjoyed this thing because he was actually doing the work, uh, even though he wasn't getting paid for it. And then, you know, many of those things turned into many of those situations turned into introductions to other companies or several of them turned into job offers mm -hmm. and they were, um, I don't know. That's a, that's a way that you can, you can certainly do that. Um, even in a job capacity too, at the, at the same time, mm -hmm. versus we also have done that with several people that are getting into consulting as well. Yeah. It's also a really good approach if you don't have like the, the credentials or yeah. the experience just, you know, instead of trying to convince someone that you can do the work to just do it. Yeah. And they can just see for themselves. Just start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, there's always the option of getting some training. If it makes sense financially and time wise, and you need a degree to do the thing or a license or taking a class, that's always an option as well. Very cool. Oh. There's one oh, more. Well, there, but wait, there's But wait, <laughs> bonus. Um, emphasize your transferable skills when you're up for something in a new industry. Um, I spoke with a woman named Mariah Wilberg who had 
a background in various different industries, a lot of kind of health education and social justice stuff. And at one point she was applying to be a paralegal and she had no legal training or experience. And she, what she did was she just talked about the things that she did in her previous jobs that were relevant. So she said, you know, I work in high stress environments with emotional clients. I'm really good at meeting tight deadlines, like those sorts of things. So if you can show how, if you, if you don't have much experience in the area, but you can show how the things you've explored in the past are relevant and how those skills can be applicable to the job at hand, that can really go a long way. Very cool. Well, hey, uh, I out of time? Am, well, we're getting, getting close to the end of time here, but I really want to make sure that uh, uh, we'll save just a minute or two if, in case anybody has a question here okay. and at least put it out to the folks that, uh, that are here live attending. Uh, if you have any questions for Emily, go ahead and type into the, into the chat box and let us know. But while you're doing that, if we've got any questions, I would, I would love to, uh, First of all, I'll just say thank you because uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate you being willing to uh, move some of your schedule around and stuff too. Because I know you got sick last week and we had planned on uh, planned on doing this and and yeah, forces yeah. of nature against us, but uh, <laughs> but still made it happen. So I very 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 much appreciate that. And I have I've perused through the book, really enjoyed what I've read so far. And um, the book, by the way, is How to Be Everything. And where, where can people find that too, if they're interested in going and picking that up or learning more about you or anything else? Yeah, they can find it at howtobeeverything.com. It's also available at, you know, all of the online retailers and bookstores and such. And if they want to learn more about me, they can head over to puttylike, P-U-T-T-Y-L-I-K-E.com. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, any, anything else that you would add for, for folks that are getting started or any parting advice, Emily? Mm, parting advice. Um, yeah, I, you know, I feel like when you make this discovery about yourself that you're a multi-potentialite, there can be this big moment of like, oh my God, that explains so much. I'm not weird. Um, I actually have superpowers and there are other people out there like this who are making it work, who are you know, actually really thriving. <laughs> but then that realization can be followed up by a question that's like, okay, now what? Now, how do I make a living? And like, what do I do with my various interests? And how do I make this work? Um, and I guess I just want to say, like, it's completely possible to have a life with plenty of variety that is also that also provides you with stability and um, you don't need to be, people think that multi-potentialites are these flaky people who jump around and like are unreliable. And that is just not what I've seen. You know, we're like architects and doctors and CEOs and like famous artists, like multi-potentialites can do incredible work. And so don't buy into that idea that um, we're jack of all trades, master of none. It's totally possible to nail this stuff and to, to thrive as a multipod. Absolutely love it. And completely agree with it. And I'm a little biased because I fall into that category. But I, I really, really appreciate you making the time. Said it before, but absolutely mean that, Emily. Thank you so much. And I, uh, I'm excited to, to one, see how, how the book does. I think people are going to love it. And two, keep me, keep me posted on how things are going. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. Hey, thank you everybody for, for hanging out with us and uh, feel free to let us know what you thought or reach out to Emily and uh, anything else you need, you know exactly where, where I'm at and where our team is at. I will, I will see you all later. Have a great one.